Matthew Bell with Alzheimer'sProof.com. I just wrapped up a four-part series on the relationship between sugar, sweeteners, and the mind diet. The mind diet, you'll recall, is the diet that's geared towards helping you to preserve cognitive and mental function and try to minimize or eliminate your risk for Alzheimer's disease and other forms of cognitive impairment and dementia. But in that series, in the fourth installment, which focused on artificial sweeteners, I bumped up against a bunch of information on the relationship between the gut, your digestive system and intestines, and the brain. And it was too much really to do justice to in that video. And so I decided to pull that content out, expand on it, and that's what I'd like to pursue today. So this is where I left off in the video on artificial sweeteners. And I realized there was just too much information to get into fully in that video. So in Frontiers in Cellular and Infection Microbiology, under the section heading Unhealthy Nutrition Linked to Alzheimer's Disease and Gut Microbiome, we read so-called Western diet, which is characterized by high intake of saturated fats and added sugars, is one of the symbols of the modern lifestyle, and it is an established risk factor for Alzheimer's disease development. How so? Well, firstly, it can change gut microbiota for the worse. It can contribute to the development of dementia. It can promote cognitive impairment in general. It can induce oxidative stress. It can cause deterioration of neuron cells or even neuronal apoptosis, that is cell death. And it also is linked with a significant increase in amyloid deposition. And of course, amyloid deposition refers to the protein gunk that accumulates in the brain of people who have Alzheimer's disease. Now, I was put onto this by a friend of mine, thank you, Bill, who forwarded to me Food for Thought, How Your Belly Controls Your Brain, which was a talk, a TEDx talk by Ruri Robertson. Robertson is an Irish scientist who gets into the connection between the digestive system and the brain. And you can see on the screen several different illustrations of that, which he is very competent to unpack. And if you're interested, I invite you to see that video for yourself. But Robertson throws things back on a 19th to 20th century Russian immunologist by the name of Ilya or Eli Mechnikov, among other things. He was a Nobel Prize winner for his work in immunology. But he also began to develop a concept of the gut-brain interaction. The phrase for that has come to be gut microbiome. So the microbiome in this case is defined as the totality of microorganisms, bacteria, viruses, protozoa, and fungi, and their collective genetic material present in the gastrointestinal tract or the GI tract. Now, the gut microbiota, also called intestinal flora, also called the gut microbiome, is made up of trillions of cells. In fact, according to this Medical News Today article, it could be as many as 100 trillion. And they add that these bacteria outnumber human cells in the body 10 to 1. Biggest population of these microbes reside in the gut in your intestines, your digestive system. But you should not see this as some alien invasion. Rather, the microbiota is important for nutrition, immunity, and specifically in line with the focus of this channel, effects on the brain and on behavior. So back to the links between the gut microbiome, aging, modern lifestyle, and Alzheimer's disease, we read that the intestinal microbiome can influence one's health either directly or indirectly. So for example, a study at the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center showed that there were significant differences differences in the composition of the intestinal microbiome in patients with Alzheimer's disease as compared to healthy people. So significant quantitative and qualitative changes in the gut microbiome have been reported in patients with Alzheimer's disease. They also note that levels of bifidobacterium and lactobacillus were lower in groups of elderly people, even those who did not have Alzheimer's disease. So this seems to be related to the aging process, even apart from Alzheimer's. But I also point out that it is not just Alzheimer's disease that sees this connection. We see this also with traumatic brain injury, which can cause intestinal damage. There's actually a two-way brain-gut interaction. So research has revealed that various interactions may contribute to increased infections in patients with traumatic brain injury and that these infections may worsen their brain damage. So this underscores this bi-directionality between your digestive system and your nervous system. Researchers have known for years that this exists, this connection. But what it suggests is that there is a vicious cycle in which brain injury can cause gut dysfunction, and then the gut dysfunction can worsen the brain injury. But would you believe it's also linked to autism? Nature.com, could the gut microbiome be linked to autism? Science Daily, research confirms gut-brain connection in autism, adding that up to 90% of people with autism suffer from gut problems. See the dates on these articles, 2020, 2019. An article on the National Library of Medicine's website, PubMed, association between gut microbiota and autism. 
autism, recent studies found that autistic individuals harbor an altered bacterial gut microbiota. And would you believe it's also connected with ADHD? So micronutrients affect gut bacteria associated with ADHD, according to Medical Express. Again, back to the National Library of Medicine, gut bacteria has been identified and linked to behaviors in ADHD. And in general, they're talking about the influence that bacteria in the gut has on behavior and on mentality in people with ADHD. Now, here's an interesting facet of this. Essentially, the implication so far has been that the bacteria is good, but in this case, we notice that some of the bacteria can actually cause negative effects. So there's good bacteria and bad bacteria. In this particular article, we read that micronutrients lower gut bacteria associated with ADHD. So there is some bacteria that's associated with ADHD, and it says that children with ADHD who took these micronutrients, which they spell out in the article, had lower levels of bacteria linked to the psychological disorder and a healthier range of bugs in their gut overall. Why is all of this important? According to the journal Autism, there's a substantial overlap between autism spectrum disorder and other psychiatric disorders, including ADHD. And this includes a potential link between Alzheimer's disease and autism spectrum disorder. That's at least being investigated. And one of the reasons for that is because they have some common clinical features like language language impairment, executive function impairment, and motor problems. I myself have explored the potential for there being an Alzheimer's ADHD link, at least in terms of some recent news reports that suggested there could be one. But what about causes? The first thing is I was put onto this in virtue of the research I was doing on sweeteners. Science Daily artificial sweeteners have toxic effects on gut microbes. One collaborative study indicated the relative toxicity of six artificial sweeteners including aspartame, sucralose, saccharin, neotame, adventame, and acesulfame potassium K, and 10 sporting supplements containing these artificial sweeteners. And what they found was that bacteria in the digestive system became toxic when exposed to even very low concentrations of these artificial sweeteners. But really, artificial sweeteners are just one component of diet. So if we go to the article, Brain-Gut Microbiota Access in Alzheimer's Disease, after a rehearsal of some of the basic information that we've been going over, disturbances along the brain gut access may significantly contribute to the pathogenesis of neurodegenerative disorders, including Alzheimer's disease, we read that the convergence of gut-derived inflammatory responses may be in line with aging and poor diet. So diet is extraordinarily important. Of course, I get into diet in a dedicated video on the mind diet. I've done four videos on sugar and sweeteners. I have a video on the importance of water. Back to frontiers in cellular and infection microbiology one of the possible explanations for the reduced number of species and qualitative composition of the bacteria in elderly people is a potential decrease in their adhesion to the intestinal walls of these people. Is that related to aging? Is it related to diet? Well, here's another factor. This intestinal dysbiosis could be caused by various antibiotics. And here they mention ampicillin. So firstly, dysbiosis is just a fancy word for this intestinal imbalance. But it's worth noting that seniors 65 and up, though they only comprise 13.7% of the U.S. population, use 40% of all prescription drugs. And people 65 to 69 fill an average of 14 prescriptions a year. And adults 80 to 84 fill 18 prescriptions a year on average. Now, those prescriptions could be for literally anything. It could be for blood pressure and cholesterol. But to the extent that they are antibiotics, there are fairly clear indications that antibiotics can have a negative effect on the intestinal flora. So in this article, Facing a New Challenge, the Adverse Effects of Antibiotics on Gut Microbiota and Host Immunity, we read that although antibiotic therapy is considered a milestone in fighting infectious diseases, its negative effects on gut microbiota and host health have been recognized. Now, there's a caveat here. The Smithsonian Magazine, in the article, The Gut Microbiome Could Speed Up the Progression of Alzheimer's Disease, actually gives us a case where some of the intestinal bugs are bad. So we already looked at ADHD being linked to one sort of bad bacteria. And here again, we read about the immune system going haywire due in part to bacteria. So normally your immune system can help to remove this amyloid beta that develops into plaques that are characteristic of Alzheimer's disease. In some cases, microglia run into these amyloid plaques, give off inflammatory chemicals, and can actually make Alzheimer's disease worse. Granted, this was a study in rodents, but what they found was when they administered antibiotics to various mice, it altered their gut microbial communities, and they found that the microglia stayed in check and the mice had fewer amyloid beta plaques. So the upshot is some bacteria can be good, some can be bad. Could antibiotics play a role in treatment? Possibly.
do antibiotics play a role in the onset of Alzheimer's? Again, possibly. So hopefully you see that we have a ways to go in terms of understanding Alzheimer's disease. But they add, we're not likely to start giving long-term antibiotics to treat Alzheimer's disease, and yet the findings are suggestive. what can be done. The first thing, probiotics like Lactobacillus helveticus significantly improve cognitive impairment. And in the article Brain Gut Microbiota Axis, we see a similar point being made. Modifications of the gut microbiota composition by food-based therapy or by probiotic supplementation may create new preventive and therapeutic options in Alzheimer's disease. So of course, probiotics can be administered as capsules, but the food-based therapy is one thing that can be easily accessible for a lot of people. And in the journal Nutrients, the article Fermented Foods, we are given some examples of this. So fermentation is a chemical process essentially where carbohydrates are broken down in part by bacteria. And fermented foods are defined as foods or beverages produced through controlled microbial growth and the conversion of food components through enzymatic action. And these have undergone a surge in popularity recently due mainly to their proposed health benefits. And that's precisely what we've been going over, the potential to improve your gut health and thereby get overall health benefits, including cognitive benefits. So people are attracted to these because of potential impact they have on gut microbiota. So one example is kefir, which is kind of a fermented milk-like product. Another is a tea called kombucha, the German cabbage preparation, sauerkraut. A number of these are going to have to do with fermented soy. So for example, the Indian dish tempeh or the Japanese natto. There's a related food called miso, a Korean cabbage preparation, there's a lot of cabbage, a lot of soy, kimchi in this case, Korean cabbage preparation. Sourdough bread is another example. So these are all fermented foods of various kinds that can promote intestinal health. But I would be remiss if I didn't at least mention yogurt. Not only is yogurt high in protein, according to Medical News Today, it's got vitamins and minerals, but it's also an excellent source of probiotics. Yogurt naturally contains certain probiotics, but sometimes manufacturers add additional ones, and these can include the, the fairly well-known lactobacillus acidophilus. You should be aware that some yogurts are heat-treated, and that can kill active bacterial cultures. So the article recommends that you look for yogurts that have live and active cultures seals written on the package. I hope that something that I said was of interest or of help to you. If it was, I ask that you click the like button, click the subscribe button, click the notification bell to be alerted to new content as it becomes available. I thank you so much for joining me today, and I look forward to seeing you again in another video.